गुड इवनिंग गोपाल सर गुड इवनिंग आई एम सॉरी आई एड म्यूटेड माई सेल्फ गुड मॉर्निंग राघुल और गुड मॉर्निंग राघुल हाउ यू हाउ इज योर वाइफ फाइन सर फाइन सर ओके Has she finished her OB/GYN? Sorry, sir. Isn't she doing a GYN rotation or fellow MD fellowship? Ah, uh, she is. Okay. She has I thought it's fine. So. All right. Okay. Good. I'm muting myself now. Okay, sir.
Good morning, all. Chetan? Good morning, David. Good morning, good morning Santosh. Uh, good evening, Gopal. Good morning, everybody. Good. So, how are you, Gopal? I'm okay. I'm okay. okay. You're doing all right? We're having a NABH inspection by the end of the week on Thursday and Friday. Okay. All right. You're all, well, all the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Polish up and every be ready. Uh, pardon me? I said polish up and be ready. Uh, sorry, Gopal. I said just be ready, I said. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I think this time, I think we are much uh, better off uh, in our readiness than earlier. Uh, you are a new nursing superintendent. Uh, Wonderful. That's good. Excellent. Good morning, sir. Uh, is my screen visible and am I audible, sir? Yes, Jethan, please go on. <clears throat> I'll be talking about uh, management of patellar instability. Uh, so it is estimated that around 2 to 3% uh, of the presentations involving the knee are patellar dislocations with uh, approximately around uh, 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 the caseload of 29 per uh, 1 lakh per capita risk for first time patellar dislocation among adolescents so uh, the patellar dislocation is very common in uh, age group of 10 to 17 uh, and some studies say uh, the female preponderance preponderance as uh, is more but uh, uh, literature says it is not so and uh, 50 to 60 percent of the initial uh, first time dislocators uh, will be secondary to sports related injury and in majority of them, uh, there is a compromised MP MPFL and middle retinaculum. So, Dijor and uh, School of Lyon classified patients having patellofemoral pathology into three groups. Uh, type 1 is subjective patellar instability or uh, dislocation, potential patellar instability or, or dislocation, and painful patellar syndrome. So, uh, in uh, OPI, uh, there is in OPI there is a history of her. one second. Sir. In OPI, uh, there is a history of uh, one <clears throat> documented dislocation with respect to at least one anatomical risk factor with pain. And this dislocation is further classified into uh, recurrent uh, with more than three episodes, habitual with uh, uh, dislocation during early knee flexion and permanent during the entire range of motion. So in uh, uh, OPI, uh, there is anatomical risk factor associated with uh, documented dislocation with knee pain. In PPI, uh, there is no documented dislocation, but there is anatomical risk factors, which I'll be talking about it later in, in further slides, associated with pain. In uh, a painful uh, patellar syndrome, uh, there is only knee pain without any anatomical risk factors or documented dislocation. Uh, so the role of uh, MPFL as the most important patellar st uh, stabilizer during first 30 degrees has been well established uh, uh, before. And uh, during the first 30 degrees of flexion, MPFL provides around uh, 50 to 60 percent of medial restraint to lateral sublux subluxation. And uh, with uh, uh, progressing flexion, trochlear groove uh, provides the uh, stability with the uh, deeper knee flexion. Variants in tro uh, trochlear morphology, uh, like uh, which will be discussed in the further slides, uh, having uh, according to Dijur's classification, is also very important to be noted. Uh, coming to uh, evolution and assessment, it is to be differentiated whether is it the pain or instability. Uh, At-risk uh, knees dislocate during uh, slight knee flexion 
with slight tibial external rotation movement or during a direct impact on the medial patella. Uh, patella, patella is uh, most vulnerable at uh, early flexion as it is not engaged to the trochlea yet. Uh, so increase the Q angle, it is actually the measure of uh, lateral vector on uh, quadriceps activation on the patella and uh, increase in Q angle in cases like severe genu genuvalgum and increased tibial external rotation causes uh, this lateral directed vector and uh, uh, causes the patella to be dislocated. And uh, during further uh, flexion, patella, patella is uh, trapped onto the la lateral compartment of the knee causing complete dislocation. Uh, squinting gives the clue that uh, patient is having uh, uh, excessive femoral antiversion. And one more uh, uh, presentation is pain-related buckling is often confused by the patient as patellar instability, but it is not so. It is due to the quadriceps inhibition due to painful stimulus, especially while loading the patella on while climbing the stair. Usually, acute uh, Dislocation will present with uh, marked hemarthrosis, tenderness, and palpation of the middle the border of the patella, and most importantly, locking. Uh, in subacute and uh, chronic condition, uh, marked apprehension with uh, static and uh, dynamic assessments can be seen than in acute settings because uh, due to effusion or the patient's uh, uh, <clears throat> Comfortability in performing the test. The sensitive sensitivity for apprehension test is around only 39%, and the moving apprehension sign is found to be 100% sensitive and 88% specific for uh, determining the patellar instability. So, uh, moving apprehension uh, sign is when there is a lateral direct directed force. Uh, from extension to flexion, uh, uh, extension to flexion, that is the part one. Part uh, two of the test is uh, middle direct force repeated in this manner. So for this uh, patellar apprehension test to be positive, uh, both uh, part one and part two be positive. <clears throat> and uh, other signs which have already been discussed are uh, the patellar light test. It is normal only if uh, the two quadrants, that is only the half of the pat patella, moves. And if it is if the transfer is more than half of the patella, then it is positive. Based on hypermobility, it should be assessed uh, on the contralateral side. And also, beaten criteria more than 5 by 9 uh, indicates there is hypermobility. Uh, patella tilt test by uh, both, both uh, medial and lateral. Uh, while performing the median patellar tilt test, if it is very tight, that is the indication for lateral release. The J, J sign, J sign uh, causes, uh, I mean, gives an insight to any cross malalignment, trochlear dysplasia, or patellar uh, patella alta. Uh, positive uh, grain test or class test uh, is an, uh, gives clue about. Uh, Condromisha patella, oral limb alignment like genovalgum, excessive tibial uh, femoral antiversion is to be noted. Uh, so, the anatomical risk factor for uh, the patella dislocation, uh, and uh, this forms the main basis for the treatment. Uh, usually, uh, investigation is standard uh, x rays, AP lateral and axial. Uh, true lateral uh, X-ray gives insight to uh, trochlear dysplasia as well as uh, patellar alta. Uh, Dijur in 18, uh, 1987 described four anatomical factors leading to patellar dislocation. That is uh, trochlear dysplasia, patellar patella alta, excessive TTT gypsum, and patellar tilt. So patella alta is uh, high riding patella, and uh, <clears throat> due to high riding, it it causes delay in engagement within the groove and causes uh, free range of motion till it engages the trochlear sulcus. And this increases the quadriceps momentum. Uh, and because uh, the, the patella is high, uh, is high riding, it increases quadriceps uh, momentum, causing extra uh, pressure on the patella femoral joint, causing cartilage degeneration. Uh, it is the Caton t shams index, which is probably best to assist the patella alta, given it obviates the need to obtain the lateral radiograph in 30-degree flexion. 
one more advantage is it is not affected by tubal tuberosity abnormalities and interstitial patellar femoral study established it is the preferred method for patellar height so this is the cotton uh, bishop's uh, ratio anything more than 1.2 the, the blue line divided by yellow is uh, the cotton bishop's and uh, anything more than 1.2 is patella alta uh, in contradistinction with uh, uh, the blackburn peel ratio this blackburn peel ratio uh, uh, this actually exactly needs the need to be flexed in 30 degree of flexion and uh, while well, comparing with the incel salvati the nose of the patella this extra thing is uh, not taken into consideration in cotton dishams uh, and coming to trochlear dysplasia uh, so on x-ray either one of the three uh, if present uh, it uh, gives the diagnosis of trochlear dysplasia one is the crossing sign where the trochlear sulcus uh, meet the anterior uh, uh, part of the uh, cortex and uh, there is a supratrochlear spur where there is bump in the anterolateral aspect of the uh, lateral uh, trochlea and the point where it meets the anterior cortex is the supratrochlear spur and double contour where there is hypoplastic middle facet. So the lower the crossing sign, the lower the crossing sign, the higher the grade of trochlear dysplasia and uh, uh, Trochlear spur is actually similar to the sky ramp uh, and the double contour sign. Uh, advanced diagnostic imaging is necessary like CT and MRI uh, to find out whether there are osteochondral lesions in the acute settings, which uh, I actually described as locking during the clinical presentation. And uh, to better define the trochlear morphology, alignment and patellar height. And uh, DHOR provided the classification system reviewing the X-rays and CT scans. So defining the trochlear spur, this is the bump on the anterolateral aspect of the trochlear, uh, uh, trochlear, uh, trochlear surface. And uh, we can see, so what happens is, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, when trochlear, uh, supratrochlear uh, spur associated with uh, uh, shallow uh, trochlea, uh, during early flexion, the uh, patella is uh, skids off to the lateral aspect and uh, chances of uh, relocating the patella during uh, further uh, knee flexion becomes difficult. So this is the sky ramp I was talking about. So uh, even though we might feel the trochlear spur is the lateral constraint, it will actually cause patella to skid and uh, be placed on the lateral aspect, uh, causing continued dislocation. So this is uh, Dijo's classification. Uh, so type one is just the crossing sign positive. Uh, the, with the shallow trochlea and type 2 is uh, supratrochlear spur along with the uh, crossing sign. So this is uh, flat trochlea, this is CT image. Mm -hmm. Type 3 is having uh, crossing sign with double contour. There is no supratrochlear spur here. Type 4 is all three, crossing sign, supratrochlear spur and uh, uh, double contour. So uh, the basis of trochleoplasty is based on this classification where trochleoplasty finds very uh, significant in type B and type D, uh, Dijor dysplasia. And coming to the third anatomical risk factor, that is TG, and it has largely supplemented the use of Q-angle in assessing uh, oral lateralization of TT, tibial uh, tuberosity. Classically, uh, more than 20 mm has been set the threshold for excessive TT resistance, um, above which a surgical intervention might be considered. And uh, Considering MRI to report for TTG, TTDJ, it is uh, MRI can actually underestimate uh, TTDJ distance by up to 4 mm. Challenge in the aforementioned 20 mm threshold in CT. And MRI, uh, uh, MRI also has a uh, uh, role in uh, assessing supratrochlear uh, spur height, the patellar trochlear index, and the sagittal patellar engagement. Uh, uh, sagittal patellar engagement less than 45 is the indication of trochlear dysplasia. So this is the patellar articular surface length blue line. This is uh, the maximum height length of the uh, trochlear sulcus. Green is the trochlear height. So sagittal patellar engagement is this red line divided by blue. This gives uh, that uh, the engagement of patella into the trochlear sulcus. Uh, if it is uh, less than 4.5, shows it is patella alta. And one more important uh, factor is TTPCL value. Uh, anything more than 24 mm is actually abnormal. 
uh, was proposed recently and uh, does not have any superiority in, uh, superiority compared to TTG distance. And uh, previous published work uh, reported that uh, less than 3 mm uh, is 100% sen sensitive and uh, specific for abnormal morphology. Uh, mere flatness is actually not the reason for uh, trochloplasty, but the presence of trochlears per that is type B and D of uh, detour classification uh, is the basis for trochloplasty. Coming to management, first time dislocators are usually managed conservatively allowing for an efficient to resolve, or if the patient presents with uh, too much of pain, we can actually aspirate also. Uh, other condition is, uh, other treatment modality is reconditioning the VMO, and uh, there are studies stating that uh, there is positive role in VMO reconditioning, uh, allowing the adequate return of range of movement and function uh, without recurrence uh, forms the basis of the treatment. And, uh, investigation getting to explore the anatomical risk factors as you described before and MRI, especially in the adolescent group where there is osteochondral fragments uh, leading to a block. Uh, furthermore, uh, there are patellar taping and stabilization brace with moderate effect to decrease uh, the subjective feeling of patellar instability. And uh, for many, the non-operative management might fail, resulting in uh, recurrent patellar apprehension. Uh, and it shows that uh, there is residual micro instability with subluxation without flank dislocation. So acute patellar dislocation, uh, we take XS and MRI. So if uh, there is no, and C for osteochondral lesion, if there is no osteochondral lesion, then conservative management. If there is osteochondral lesion, then uh, diagnostic arthroscopy and treat the osteochondral lesion accordingly. If uh, it is uh, unrepairable, now we can actually go for oats and associate and uh, adding to it, adding to the osteochondral fragment repair, uh, repair MPFL reconstruction is performed. Uh, operative management, the basis for operative management are MPFL reconstruction, trochloplasty, and tibial tuberculosis osteotomy, and it forms the mainstay. Uh, uh, medial patellar, uh, patellar femoral ligament reconstruction forms the mainstay of uh, proximal soft tissue stabilization procedure. And it dramatically reduces subjective instability and frank dislocation. It is a powerful surgical procedure recreating the medial soft tissue check ream. Uh, and uh, it is vital to ensure that the remaining bony anatomy that contributes to patellar instability is identified and addressed in a satisfactory man manner to maximize the good outcome uh, with. MPFL reconstruction. Now, coming to repair, a very limited ro role for uh, uh, repair. Uh, this is because uh, we tend to, I mean, uh, to be, it is very difficult to identify the site of uh, the MPFL rupture. And we tend to uh, advance the soft tissue during the attempted repairs and uh, causes uh, stiffness. But more important complication with this is uh, recurrent patellar dislocation. And uh, there are uh, literatures supporting that there is no uh, significant difference in outcome be between the repair and uh, non-operative treatment, and it is almost obsolete. Uh, so this is the diagram showing the repair of uh, MPFL using su suture anchors. And isolated MPFL reconstruction, there is uh, preset uh, indications. Uh, so, there should it, the patient should have uh, normal TTG, TTG, that is the cutoff is 20, 20 mm, it should be less than 20 mm, and D or type A trochlea, shallow trochlea, and uh, cation D shams uh, uh, measurement of uh, less than 20. I'm seeing tendons, either gracilis or semitendinosis, are uh, uh, most commonly used in two-tailed co configuration. Uh, in young patients uh, where there is an open physis, it is worthwhile to consider a medial quarters stand down. Uh, critical to the success of procedure is the proper, proper position of the graft on the femur to rest restore the anatomy. And uh, Shortland's point is the routinely referenced point which places the femoral tendon within 5 mm of isometric point for femoral fixation. So this is the uh, radiological landmark uh, for uh, fixation of MPFL according to Shortland. So this is the posterior cortex and uh, the distal line is on the poster, poster most aspect of the lumen sets line and uh, the orange line is uh, orange line is uh, the proximal part of the posterior femoral condyle. 
So shuttle point is somewhere around 1.3 mm anterior to the posterior cortex and in approximately uh, mid line between these two proximal and distal lines. Uh, so uh, this is the study by Stephen et al. Where uh, they found out uh, the femoral attachment uh, and uh, varying uh, uh, femoral attachment and how it actually alters the functional outcome. So uh, this is the adducted uh, tubercle and this is the middle epicondyle. So they uh, they marked the same on the cadaver model and the midpoint is chosen. Once this center circle, once the midpoint is chosen, they took a five mm proximal, distal, five mm anterior and posterior. And uh, in patella, they centered over the patella, uh, this uh, patella uh, medial surface, and 5 mm uh, proximal to it and 5 mm distal to it. And on an X ray, it looked like this. So this is the adductor tubercle and the middle epicondyle. The midpoint is chosen. Uh, so they concluded that uh, the actual point is actually uh, 60. If you take the anterior posterior. Uh, posterior uh, length as uh, the 100%, 60% uh, anterior and 50% proximal to the distal femoral condyle is the point of uh, MPFL, uh, this one, MPFL attachment. And uh, there is no definitive guidance as to what knee flexion angle to fix the graft. However, uh, there is evidence to support that fixation beyond 60 degree of flexion will exacerbate any malpositioned uh, femoral tunnel uh, placement. And this, this is confirmed uh, by the study by Boris et al. in 2015. And uh, a malpositioned femoral tunnel will create a, a grossly anisometric uh, graft with placement 2 for proximal, uh, resulting in uh, graft being tight in flexion. And uh, if the placement is 2 for distal, the graft is loose in flexion. Finally, while tensioning, it is not uh, the same as uh, tensioning the ACL or other uh, ligament reconstructions. And uh, over tensioning uh, actually is the common mistake which we do and can uh, result in loss of uh, flexion or over medialization and potentiality to result in painful chondrosis. Biomechanical studies shows that only uh, two newtons of force is required to adequately stabilize the patella and restore normal contact pressures. Uh, when it is fixed at the femoral insertion site with the knee in 30 degrees of flexion. Uh, so outcomes and complications of MPFL uh, repair, uh, as already described, this is the important surgical technique which reduce uh, recurrent dislocation. Uh, Kita et al. in the study reported 4.5% uh, of redislocation rate, where uh, intervimer showed 95% excellent uh, outcome scores in patient treated with uh, MPFL reconstruction. And a single uh, uh, large uh, retrospective case series by Sheepover et al. examined 192 knees in the study using 4.5 mm patellar tunnels. And complication rate were uh, around 20%, of which 14% uh, considered major. And uh, seven patellar fractures were reported with this technique uh, because of uh, two tunnels used with the 4 mm drill bit. And uh, they concluded saying that uh, usage of uh, uh, smaller tunnel will actually help preventing this complication. Uh, MPFL reconstruction with associated deformities like genovalgum or uh, femoral antiversion uh, can uh, actually be corrected with uh, pony procedures like distal femoral osteotomies or derotational osteotomies. And if the patient is skeletally, skeletally immature, we can actually have epiphysiodesis. So this is a patient with a patellar dislocation with genu valgum, and we and the authors have done the growth arrest in the middle femoral condyle, and we can see the correction of uh, the uh, limb associate uh, plus uh, MPFL reconstruction. So. Uh, in adult with the genu valgum, the distal femoral open wedge osteotomy with MPFL uh, has a good, a good uh, outcome. And uh, with uh, excessive femoral antiversion of more than 25 degrees, uh, uh, supracondylar distal femoral derotational osteotomies with uh, reconstruction provides uh, good results. So this is uh, the pre-op image and we can see the convergence uh, angle. 
Uh, and uh, once it is corrected with uh, open wedge osteotomy, uh, the convergence angle also corrects. When this is actually added with um, MPFLR, it it has good results. Uh, this is with femoral uh, excessive femoral antiversion. We can see actually some squinting of patella, and uh, this is the pre-op uh, planning and the rotational osteotomy done, and this is a little bit pointing out to the reconstruction. Trochloplasty, a brief note, it is actually done for uh, type B and D. We actually saw, so there is shallow trachea, trochlea and uh, there is bump on the anterolateral aspect of the... Yeah, then uh, we shall skip this. Uh, this is being covered by the next talk. Yes, sir. Bonus procedures. Okay, sir. Uh, so that final treatment uh, uh, protocol is... Uh, uh, Objective patella dislocation with the actual anatomical risk factors and also with uh, dislocation uh, history. So if it is uh, less than two to three dislocation, uh, usually conservative uh, management is followed. And if it fails, operative management. And uh, if the patient actually presents with more than two to three dislocations, operative management is followed. Uh, so if uh, uh, there is uh, C, um, ketone deschamps uh, less than uh, 1.2, trochlear dysplasia A, and uh, TTTG less than 20, MPFL reconstruction, isolated MPFL reconstruction is uh, performed. And if it is, uh, if the patient has trochlear dysplasia, especially B and D, uh, trochloplasty is done. And uh, if it is uh, C, but that is patellar alta, distalization and medialization is done. Uh, for patellar alta, tibial tubercle distalization is done. And uh, if TTTG is more than uh, 20, uh, tibial tubercle medialization and uh, middle patella tilt the negative lateral resistance. So the take home message is the key to treat uh, patients with patella dislocation is to make the right diagnosis. The major impact of intrinsic instability factors is to be noted, uh, primarily being the tro trochlear dysplasia, which needs to be screened by x-rays and uh, also CT and MRI. Uh, patella alta uh, needs to have correction on uh, x-rays and MRI. Uh, by looking into SP, that is sagittal patel uh, trochlear engagement, which gives uh, added value to the surgical indication. Axial mm -hmm. alignment quantified the, by the TTD uh, distance uh, gives uh, the basis of uh, treatment for TTO, and uh, it is imperative to provide the individualized treatment regimen. And uh, MPFL reconstruction performed with the careful att attention of patients, uh, TTTG, see uh, ketone mm -hmm. and uh, PTA gives good results. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chetan. Uh, whenever you're preparing for any talk, you need to see your previous uh, talks and the next talk. So um, last week, we covered in detail about all the uh, assessment, about clinical and ra radiological assessment. So um, minimal overlap is fine, but uh, your talk today is supposed to be on soft tissue procedures, basically, even though your title says management of atlant stability, we wanted to know about the soft tissue procedures because the next talk is on bony procedures. So not much was uh, dealt with soft tissue. Briefly, it was covered. So there are so many soft tissue procedures for atlant stability. Uh, you told about two, which is, uh, I mean, uh, the quads, how exactly quads uh, is used for MPFL reconstruction was not elaborated. Um, there are other procedures with the minimal modifications. So that's what we uh, wanted to know in detail in this talk. So you had mentioned about that uh, three uh, abbreviations, PPS. Can you can you elaborate them again? The three uh, painful patella syndrome. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, this is uh, objective patellar instability where there is, uh, uh, when which we see... Year, which year? Are you? Okay, it's quite old. Okay, fine, fine. Okay, and I'm not sure these terms are still used or not. I've not come across these terms, I mean, frequently in the literature, which I wanted to know. Okay, these, uh, there are, there's a newer article which actually tries to standardize the terms used in patellar instability. Uh, this painful patella syndrome, anterior knee pain syndrome, and there are two more terms. All are used interchangeably. So it's better to have, okay, we'll have that as a journal club uh, paper. 
or the terms used to describe all the patellofemoral issues. This is quite an old article, so let's not take this into consideration. Mm, nothing much to discuss. Mm, the soft tissue procedures are the one which we wanted to discuss here. Did you see our uh, technique, our article, which is there, which describes our technique, which is published? Mm -hmm. So you have to see that also. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I, I think you can ask him to do one more time because soft tissue uh, surgery is the most uh, mainstay of treatment. Yes, and uh, like MPTL and all that, uh, it became popular. I don't know what happened to that. Uh, maybe uh, you can ask him to do next time. Yes, sir. So then cover only the soft tissue procedures and you can repeat it next time. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Yeah, thank you. Audible. Okay, sir. Um, good morning. I'll be presenting on the topic bony procedures and patella instability. Um, I'll be presenting on the following topics. Uh, basically, a brief word on the causes of patella instability, only what is relevant to this presentation. Then the bony procedures, depending on its indications, elaborating surgical technique on a common procedures and post-op rehab on each. And finally, the take-home message after the complications, which I've discussed. So um, initially, uh, Dijur has uh, classified into major instability and minor instability factors, namely the trochlear dysplasia, petala alta, TTTG, um, and petala tilt. Minor factors being excessive uh, femoral and tibial rotational deformities or uh, 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 recurvatum or valgum. Uh, so, Jethan, Dr. Jethan has already described about the trochlear dysplasia. Just uh, want to emphasize on one more thing. Uh, trochlear A is just the crossing sign. Uh, B is a supratrochlear uh, spur. Uh, C is where the medial uh, condyle is hypoplastic. And D is when it appears in a combination, the most severe type. Petla alter also covered uh, by Dr. Chetan. Um, this, is, uh, this is the only factor that can be responsible for dislocation even with a normal trochlea. It's a congenital problem and it is uh, due to the excessive tendon length and Caton de Champs ratio more than 1.2, insole solvity more than 1.3 is the index. This is important because later on in the Brony procedures, we need to uh, keep these in mind while we are trying to correct the uh, index. Uh, next is the TTTG ratio that is uh, also covered, um, mainly the distance between the groove and the tibial tuberosity, anything more than 20 is uh, considered abnormal, again, uh, relevant to the bony procedures that we are going to uh, uh, talk about. Last is the petala tilt, um, that is again, mainly due to the uh, vastus uh, medialis dysplasia, uh, that uh, will need a Vastus uh, tra training by physiotherapy for uh, overcoming that. One important paper that I came across was uh, Petella Maltracking, update on the diagnosis and treatment. Talking about the treatment alone, they classified it as uh, soft tissue procedures, of which uh, MPFL reconstruction, lateral release, medial imbrication was some of the important ones. Uh, and also bony procedures, where uh, tibial tubercle transfer procedures, tracheoplasty were some. In this paper, they also say that there are more than 100 uh, procedures described each catering to a different etiology and uh, only few have stood the test of time, uh, some of the bony procedures of which we'll be talking about today. So what are the goals when doing a bony procedure while correcting petala instability? The goals are the altering the insertion point of petala tendon, uh, thereby we affect the timing, position and the way in which the petala engages with the trochlea and try and biomechanically offload the damaged articular cartilage, thereby reducing the pain and increasing stability. Dijur, uh, as mentioned previously, I had uh, divided the patient groups into three. 
uh, first one being the objective patellar instability, significant by which uh, this group is the only one that will benefit from surgery. This group is basically defined as any patient having one episode of dislocation uh, or more and also having one or more anatomical abnormality like a TTTG uh, more than normal or uh, excessive rotations uh, or uh, patella alta that is present. Second is a potential patella instability group that is potentially that they have not dislocated yet, but they have an anatomic abnormality and are also symptomatic. Uh, the third is a painful patella syndrome uh, that is basically the patients that have neither dislocated nor have anatomical abnormality, but they present symptomatically with pain and uh, apprehension. So coming to the bony procedures in detail, uh, these are the some of the uh, procedures that I would like to talk about today, uh, divided into the headings, tibial tuberosity transfer, of which we'll talk about medial, distal, anterior, and fulcus sense modification, trochleoplasty, uh, the lateral facet elevating, and sulcus deepening. And then there's a petal osteotomy and derotation osteotomies, both for the femur and the tibia. So starting off with the tibial transfer, osteo uh, transfer, uh, tibial tuberosity transfer, the indications basically uh, for a medial tuberosity transfer will be an extensive mechanism malalignment with a valgus angle anywhere above 10 or a TTTG more than 20, uh, which will benefit in medializing tibial tuberosity. A petala alta um, signified by its CD ratio of uh, more than uh, 1.2. Uh, also, a fulcusens has uh, also an additional benefit in view of which uh, the high petalofemoral stress can also be alleviated because it has an anteriorizing component also. Uh, anterior tibial tuberosity transfer uh, has an additional benefit of uh, petalofemoral stress alleviation, but due to certain complications which we will talk about, it is not recommended and has fallen out of favor nowadays. Contraindications, basically fulcusens uh, especially showed that poorer results with uh, any cartilage damage in the grouping of outer bridge grade 3 or 4, uh, that is uh, partial thickness cartilage damage, uh, damage or uh, through and through where you can see the subcontral bone. Uh, if that severity lesions are present in the center of the trochlea or in the medial aspect of the trochlea, along with uh, lesions on the undersurface of the petala, then the outcomes seem to be poor because arthritis has already set in. And there is also a high possibility of failure when there is a large central grade 3 or 4 lesions on the trochlea, medial, proximal, or diffuse patella arthritis. Uh, Gutlier et al. in his uh, paper also mentioned that the shape of the trochlea uh, has to be taken into consideration before planning such bony procedures because if it is a subnormal and we medialize, the contact stress between the medial facet and the uh, of the patella and the condyle can worsen the symptomatic presentation in case of hypercorrection. So the correction have uh, corrections have to be exact and accurate. And this has to be planned prior to the um, undertaking of the bony procedure. And uh, malalignment correction, we have to make an emphasis to note down the TTTG and the Q angle uh, that has to be corrected and uh, plan accordingly. And of course, we have to mandatorily look for pre-existing signs of PFOA prior to the procedure. So starting off, uh, we'll just talk about a few procedures, tibial tuberosity transfer, and then uh, towards the end, we'll talk about the physio that would be applicable for them. Uh, starting off with the medial tibial tuberosity transfer, uh, kindly focus on the figure. So this paper um, says that anteromedial approach is the one that is routinely being used, I mean, that was uh, favored to be used here. Uh, so in this case, we separate out the tibial tuberosity from three sides, that is the medial, the proximal, and the lateral. Now, before we take out the entire tuberosity uh, and keep it separate, we have to make a pilot hole because once you already dislodge the tibial tuberosity, you try to create a pilot hole and uh, screw the uh, uh, tuberosity onto the anterior cortex, the fragment is just going to spin around and create uh, unnecessary complications. So create the pilot hole with the 3.2 mm drill bit uh, for a 4.5 screw, uh, which will be put in once the tibial tuberosity is in place. Now, once you've separated these uh, three cortices, uh, medialization of the tibial tuberosity is done according to our pre-planned correction length. So once that is done, the distal hinge is still intact. So once you rotate it towards medial, the excess of medial bone 
that is present over here is trimmed off. That is done so that unnecessary projections onto the skin. The skin is very thin there. We don't want any pressure effects onto the skin, which will lead to wound breakdown. So that is trimmed off and it is fixed in place with a 4.5 screw. After you prepare the bed and uh, we make sure that the tibial tuberosity is not proud when placed. So uh, similar procedure is distal uh, uh, tibial tuberosity transfer and it is commonly associated with a patella tendon tenodesis also. This is not a bony procedure, but this is uh, often done in unison. Uh, the reason I will be explaining now. So this is uh, the indication for the distalization is most commonly patella alta. Now, uh, like I mentioned previously, the reason why I mentioned about CD ratio is because uh, we when we consider corrections for a patella alta, we want the ratio to be as close to normal as possible. Anything below 1.2. To be on the safer side, we want it to be as close to 1 as possible. So how do you calculate how much do we have to distalize? So we take the fragment from here, uh, tibility porosity fragment from here, and how do you calculate how much we have to distalize the fragment? So in order to do that, there's a simple formula given in this paper that is 80 minus AP is equal to the L. That is 80 is the length of the patella tendon, which will be found normal. And AP is the length, longitudinal length of the articular surface of the patella. And uh, anything uh, minus that, the excess of length is equal to the corresponding length that will have to be distalized. So when you're taking the tuberosity fragment, you have to make sure to take a uh, length of the fragment which is corresponding to this which will later on be removed it will be easier when the figures uh, when i'll explain with the figures so some things that you have to remember prior to this process is uh, uh, the screw sites on the near cortex has to be prepared prior to the osteotomy because of the same thing that i mentioned uh, so uh, uh, we start drilling after we take off the tubal tuberosity it's going to be very unstable so in order to avoid that just the pilot holes, just the near cortex holes, just drill it and keep it ready uh, so that we can uh, place it much more easier. Remember the rule of twos. Two screws, two cortices for each screw. The screws have to be two centimeters apart and the proximal most screw has to be two centimeter distal from the proximal margin. Now, the length of the block is increased by the length of distalization required. That is L. That is already mentioned. Now, coming to the figures. So once you make the two screws and uh, pilot holes, now the tuberosity fragment can be osteotomized. This can be done by placing uh, drill holes along the uh, margins for the three sides. Drill holes also uh, perform an additional function that uh, when we start to osteotomize, the fracture line will not propagate. It will generally uh, follow the uh, drill hole margin itself. So once that is done, this is the tuberosity fragment that has been removed from the distal, the medial and the lateral. So this is the fragment that has been attached by the patella tendon here. So this is the gap that we uh, have after removing the distal fragment. The distal fragment will correspond to the length L that I, we have calculated preoperatively. So after removing that distal fragment, this is the gap that we have. And this is the gap that we are going to distalize. So once that is done, we pull the tibial tuberosity fragment down uh, uh, making it seated to the anterior cortex of the tibia, we put the distal screw first, uh, after which uh, we can control some medialization also. So screw should be perpendicular to the anterior border of the tibia. This is so that the uh, position of the fragment does not change while we are tightening the screw and make sure that the fixation is bicortical. So after the procedure is done, this is what it should look like. The gap has been filled by the tuberosity fragment that has been brought down and fixed by two screws. In addition to that, the authors of the paper also fixed it with an additional SS wire strengthening, augmenting the fixation. Now, uh, the patella tendon tenodesis can be done on either side of the patella tendon at the site of the, uh, the normal attachment of the tibial tuberosity. The normal, not the alter attachment, but uh, when the ratio, CD ratio, the length corresponding to that, where the patella tendon is found, we anchor that with two suture anchors on either side. So that again augments that uh, corrects the problem of patella alta. Now, uh, tibial tuberosity transfer, the anterior transfer, this is uh, uh, also fallen out of favor, not recommended nowadays because, as per the paper, this anterior transfer has proposed by McVeigh had a side effect of uh, uh, painful kneeling. 
uh, which was a problem with uh, a certain patients who have to perform their occupation or their uh, religious practices in this position. Uh, it was also slightly, uh, the protrusion on the anterior surface was uh, un um, a small problem with the cosmesis aspect also. So the advantage that this uh, procedure had was it reduced the petalofemoral joint stress and the steps were similar to the TT transfer and tricortical graft was placed between the tubercle and the tibia anterior cortex. So, and it was again fixed with one or two bicortical screws. Coming to the Fulkerson's modification, uh, this modification uh, provided anteromedial and some distalization also, but without the need for any graft to be placed and without the uh, extra pressure over the anterior aspect of the knee. How they did that is through the osteotomy being made with a 45 degree angle with respect to the axis of the tibia. Again, I'll be explaining it with figures. Uh, the main advantage with this is that it addresses the lateral instability and it helps to unload the lateral and distal patellar cartilage lesions. Indications for this procedure is TGTG anywhere uh, more than 20 and any malalignment to the lower limb that is uh, creating pressure on the subplex uh, on the patella. It decreases petella on the uh, pressure on the lateral patella facet and overall trochlea. Now coming to the surgical aspect, again, a uh, standard longitudinal incision from the lower pole of the patella and coming to the tibial tuberosity, you identify and isolate the uh, patella tendon and uh, protect it. Once that is kept safe, what we do is with the periosteal elevator, we make the uh, medial part of the uh, anteromedial part of the uh, anterolateral part of the tibia visible with uh, uh, tibialis anterior being uh, elevated off. Uh, on the medial side, what we do is we take two KOIs uh, and we uh, drill them in an angle of 45 degrees. The angle going from uh, anteromedial to posterolateral. So that is the orientation of the KYs. Once the KYs are in position on the medial side, we use the saw as uh, using the KYs as the guide. We use the saw and create the osteotomy in that 45 degree angle. Once that is done, the proximal segment is again removed and the tibial tuberosity is pried off using a flat broad osteotome. And the fragment is medialized and because of the 45 degree slope, it automatically comes anterior as well, thereby fulfilling the objective of anterior medializing the uh, tibial tuberosity fragment. And in this position, uh, we hold the tuberosity in place and we fix it and uh, trim off the excess bone. We do not want any extra pressure on the skin, which will cause any sort of bone breakdown. So what is the physio protocol for any tibial tuberosity transfer procedures? Uh, we put the patient in a straight leg splint. We encourage from post-op day one to uh, weight bear, uh, full weight bearing and uh, start off with range of motion exercise of the knee, uh, but restricted to 100 degrees. And at the end of six weeks, we stop the splint and start full range of motion with a closed ch kinetic chain exercises for strengthening the quads. Return to sports can be advised for about six months after sequential review. So after uh, tibial tuberosity transfers have been discussed, we'll move into trocheoplasty. There are two types that have uh, that are still being used today. One is the elevating lateral facet and the deepening the sulcus. Both have their own indications. Sulcus deepening can be seen in type B or type D dysplasia, which we discussed in the beginning of this presentation and also by Dr. Chetan. Uh, the petala impingement on prominent trochlea or a J sign, abnormal petala tracking are the in, uh, indications that point towards a sulcus deepening. Whereas on the lateral, uh, lateral elevating uh, facet uh, trochleoplasty, the indication is a type C dysplasia with a flat or a shallow trochlea, no trochlear prominence or other factors. And uh, this has a drawback. Lateral facet uh, elevating trochleoplasty can potentially increase the petalofemoral forces if overcorrected. The contraindications to these procedures are uh, they once the arthritis have set in, there is no point proceeding with these procedures. And also in skeletally immature patients, uh, this is not advised um, procedure to be done. Starting off with the lateral facet elevation trochleoplasty, 
it was first described in 1915 by alby uh, he described it as uh, a simple change of the architecture of the outer condyle of the femur uh, it is indeed simple when you uh, compare it to the sulcus deepening osteotomy uh, in this procedure what we do is at the osteochondral junction after we strip off the periosteum and the synovium we raise a small flap on the lateral femoral condyle anterior aspect which consists of the cartilage cover as well as 5 mm of the subchondral bone once you elevate this a graft is um, a graft is placed corticocancellous graft is to be inserted in the gap and fixed using absorbable and non absorbable sutures however recent studies have found this technique to be controversial and was later found to be biomechanically unsound so it has again uh, uh, belongs to the group of procedures that has fallen out of favor recently so coming to the sulcus deepening trochleoplasty first proposed by masse in 1978 and modified and formalized by dejour in 1987 uh, the goal of this or the function of this is to abolish the prominence of the trochlear groove and to establish the groove of a correct or appropriate depth ensuring that the patella tracking is uh, improved or normalized it is an extremely demanding surgery but it is equally effective as well so coming to the surgery you do this in the regional, regional anesthesia and the patient sedation um in the supine position like a standard tkr the incision is a uh, standard midline with the extremity flexed at 90 degrees once the subcutaneous dissection is done we do the arthrotomy and we proceed with a mid vastus approach starting 2 to 3 uh, cm on the superior medial aspect and proceeding 4 cm into the muscle belly of the vmo so once we strip off the synovium and we elevate carefully the periosteum from osteochondral margin to osteochondral margin this is what we see so we have to form a few landmarks first now this mark here corresponds to the anterior femoral cortex line that if extrapolated from here it will come in uh, uh land here so from here we draw a vertical line 3 to 6 degrees slightly on the uh, slightly laterally and we also draw uh, the diagonal lines from here that is corresponding to the sulcus that we are trying to recreate now it is mandatory that we make sure that these lines do not enter the region of the tibiofemoral joint so this is the uh, line that is going to correspond to the anterior femoral cortex a line vertical line 3 to 6 degrees laterally and the sulcus recreating line on uh, diagonally on both sides so once this is done at the proximal osteochondral junction we take a thin strip of bone outside and using a sharp osteotome we proceed to uh, move parallel to the anterior femoral cortex distally make sure that we do not penetrate the cartilage anywhere and making sure that the cartilage being elevated is always supplemented by 5 mm of subchondral bone as well now there's a way in which there's a technique in which you have to do it uh, this is the view that we have from the head end of the patient looking towards the foot and this is the uh, tunnel that we are trying to develop now while developing the tunnel you have to make sure that the anterior cartilage and the subchondral bone is as straight as possible and uh, compliant enough that we put a pressure on the anterior surface it will sit back onto the anterior femoral cortex now while looking axially you have to understand that we have to take more bone from the center compared to the periphery because when we put the anterior pressure on the uh, sulcus we want it to collapse in such a way that it does not fracture but it is compliant enough to mold itself in this trochlear fashion once it sits in this procedure uh, position we can uh, fix it using two staple pins so this is the pre, uh, prior and uh, post clinical photos prior to the procedure you can see the flat convex trochlea post procedure you can see how it has collapsed and uh, uh, forming a resemblance of a normal trochlea lateral also you can see the convexity here you can see the um, uh, normal sulcus being reformed now the orientation of the stapler pins are also important you can't uh, put both the limbs of the pins into the cartilage one limb has to be in the cartilage while the other rests on the cortical bone for additional stability this is a skyline view again 
mentioning how the staple should be foot and uh, you can see how the trochlea has reformed. Uh, Post-op physio for this uh, is immediate weight bearing, no range of motion restriction. We want the patient to start moving the knee as normally as possible and as early as possible. The reason being movement nourishes the cartilage and we are trying to protect the cartilage through this. Because trochleoplasty is rarely carried out as an isolated procedure, the post-op care will have to take into account the other procedures as well. If you're doing an MPFL or if you're doing a uh, uh, tibial tuberosity transfer, those factors also come into play. Next, a brief word about petal osteotomy. Uh, it is not a popular procedure at present and uh, many papers from North America are saying that it is not being followed due to a uh, major risk of necrosis and non-union, technically very demanding, and petella is small, poorly vascularized structure with high proportion of cortical bone, uh, which makes the risk-to-benefit ratio very uh, unfavorable. So, derotation osteotomies, uh, coming to the last section of the talk, uh, this again we can divide into femur and the tibia. Uh, femoral derotation osteotomy of recurrent patellar dislocation, this paper has indicated that uh, osteotomy can be uh, useful in lower limb malalignment in case of valgus or torsion. Valgus of more than 10 degrees, as mentioned previously, is considered a causative factor for instability and needs to be corrected. Torsional deformity surgeries must be contemplated very cautiously because if overcorrected or undercorrected, these surgeries can be very unforgiving. Um, lower limb malalignment is not a single factor alone. It can be a torsion associated with a rotational deformity associated with a varus or a valgus deformity as well. So each of these components have to be taken into consideration while we are contemplating fixation. Uh, it is uh, effective in treatment of the skeletally immature age group where other procedures like uh, TT transfer and all are contraindicated. Uh, also indicated in cases where uh, TTTG correction in tubercle transfer osteotomies alone is not possible. If the TTTG is too far, uh, too large to be corrected by uh, tibial tuberosity transfer alone, then such augmenting procedures will help. Uh, these cases have reported a lower outcome in pain and functional scoring if they had significant femoral antiversion or tibial external rotation, which means that just doing it uh, tibial tuberosity transfer or an MPFL reconstruction alone in the presence of rotational deformities is not enough. These rotational deformities also have to be corrected for the alignment to be restored back to near normal. Uh, this is what justifies the derotation osteotomies in cases where rotational malalignment of the lower limb is primary cause of the petal instability. Uh, excessive femoral intorsion alters the relationship between the femoral neck and the condyles, causing instability. It is overall a safe surgery and can be combined with adjuvant soft tissue procedures, but at the same time can be very unforgiving if done wrongly. So surgery as per usual osteotomy, uh, first we uh, mark out the osteotomy site with using two parallel KYs. Then we hold both the osteotomy sites with another set of KYs and correcting the osteotomy uh, and uh, correcting the rotational deformity uh, uh, using these as an axis. So you can see the derotation okay. osteotomy bringing back the patella tilt into the normal trochlear groove and it is usually augmented and fixed after the osteotomy, wedge osteotomy using a tomofix plate. So as mentioned previously, these procedures are not done uh, uh, alone. They, have, they are usually augmented by soft tissue procedures as well. In this case, in this paper, they have said that an MPFL reconstruction along with a derotation osteotomy um, will help in uh, further alleviating the patient's symptoms. Now, coming to the tibial section, tibial derotation osteotomy. The main problem with tibial, uh, tibial rotational deformity is that excessive external tibial torsion can be uh, found in certain sections of the population. This uh, EETT is considered to be more than 30 degrees uh, about the tibial shaft within the transverse plane as observed on radiographic imaging. The derotation osteotomy results in significantly improved pain and ROM ratings uh, in patients with patellofemoral pain and or instability. So the likelihood of complication, including recurrent patellar subluxation also is low, but uh, with increasing age, this may also increase. So uh, the tibial tuberosity transfer, 
that has been used to realign the knee extensor mechanism in symptomatic patellar femoral instability. It has been shown that in patients with uh, excessive tibial torsion, uh, tuberosity transfer alone may increase the medial tibiofemoral contact pressure as shown in the previous uh, image where a hypercorrection can increase the contact pressure over the uh, petla and the sulcus, uh, thereby aggravating the symptoms. Uh, this is the factor that is responsible for the recent rise in popularity that in patients with uh, PF instability with uh, increased contact pressure, uh, this can help alleviate or decrease the contact pressure and uh, petalofemoral uh, pain, uh, pain symptoms. Many surgeons elect to perform a combined uh, procedure, which according to the review by Hockrater et al. may provide additional anatomical correction compared to uh, derotation osteotomy without a tuberosity transfer. Now, proponents argue that symptomatic excessive external tibial torsion may be a higher contributor to increase TTTG in these cases, owing to the increase in re uh, recurrent subluxation as compared to TTTG alone. So, a combination of procedures in this case is um, warranted. So, is there a standardized rehab protocol that we can use after bony procedures? Uh, this paper released in 2020, uh, published in 2020, uh, says that the uh, protocol should be depending on the etiology. And due to the extreme variability of the etiology and the variability of the procedure done, it is not possible to guide a standardized uh, rehab protocol and it has to be tailor-made for the procedure and the cause uh, for which the procedure was done. So that is what uh, the paper is emphasizing. As per the literature, what is the uh, view that the doctors have right now for bony procedures? The outcomes are good, complications are low, recurrence rates are low, gait improvement and pain scores uh, are found to be better post-procedure. And we have the option for a tailor-made approach for each and every individual due to the variety of the procedures that we have in our arsenal. But at the same time, we have to understand that there are potential complications as well. Like every surgery, there is a risk of infection in DVT. And specifically for trochleoplasty, there is a chance of trochlear necrosis, cartilage damage, arthrofibrosis, incongruence with patella and the trochlea uh, and with the uh, tuberosity transfer we have uh, delayed union non-union tibial fracture so what have i understood from preparing this talk is that uh, the procedures that we choose help augment uh, the fixation but it has to be tailor-made depending on the etiology uh, and it has to correspond to the reasons why we are doing it. If you want to alleviate the anterior pressure of alcosense is good. If you want to medialize also, a medial tuberosity transfer is good. If the rotation is the cause of the symptoms, then uh, derotation osteotomy will be preferable along with a uh, soft tissue procedure, preferably an MPFL reconstruction. And uh, it is extremely important to choose your patients wisely. And as uh, Dijur had mentioned, the objective petla instability type 1 where they have a history of dislocation and they have symptoms and they have an anatomy abnormality, there we can go ahead and proceed with the surgery. In the other two groups, um, not, not so convincing, sir. So that is what I had uh, prepared as a take home. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ashik. Um, what you said as a take home is right. But in general, <clears throat> majority Hello, Yo, my, my, am I audible? Hello? Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so in general, the treatment of uh, petal instability is conservative majority of the time. Okay. In the case of surgery are selective and majority are soft tissue procedures. Bony okay. procedures are uh, rarely indicated, but when indicated, it must be done. Otherwise, it will result in failure. Yes. So, how to uh, select the patient and... Uh, Evaluate the patient is the key over here. So every patient has to go through this rigorous, uh, elaborate evaluation so that we are able to pick up those rare indications which are required for uh, bony procedures. So that, that's the key takeaway as you, in your talk. There are a few points which I would like to have. Can you unshare your screen? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, 
Tobina. This is uh, from one of my talks where how to assess the rotational malalignment for clinically any patient you for, for a petal instability, you have to look for this femoral antiversion. This is by this Craig's test where you mm. uh, put the patient prone, excel rotate, and feel for the GT. This will give us a gross idea how much is the femoral antiversion. Same way, tibial torsion is by the thigh foot angle. Yes. And CT and MRI will help, but CT will help in getting the <clears throat> antiversion by doing the cuts like these, where you take one cut in the hip, one cut in the knee uh, for the distal femur, and proximal tibia and distal tibia for the tibial torsion. These, these are the cuts which they do in the special sequence CT when we send to clarity. So this will give us the objective idea. Sometimes clinically we might think uh, a thigh foot angle is more, but objectively it will be normal. Mm -hmm. Or um, femoral antiversion will be, but actually it will be compensated by the tibial torsion. Femur will be externally rotated and tibia will be internal rotated. So yes. the internal limb rotational alignment will be okay, but the knee will be external rotated, but this will be compensated. So in those cases, we should not touch them thinking there is increased antiversion. But if you have to do, you have to do both levels to correct it, which is not yes. good. So those are small things which you need to note. Now this is the evaluation which you do, which is the tracking CT and the sequences which uh, consider the rotational align malalignment as well as the TTTG. Yes. Uh, which is required for whatever you mentioned. Then the Catan Desham Index. TTTG uh, is one thing where if it's more than two, they recommend, but now the recommendations have gone uh, more than 2.5. Nearing three, we do not do a TTTG transfer because we found that just with the MPFL reconstruction, all of them do well. That's what the recent literature internationally also claim. So MPFL alone in majority of situations is enough. Uh, tibial tuberosity transfers are meant only for gross um, TTTG transfers. This is one of the, is this, that paper which uh, mentions that. Okay. And TTTG transfer, you had mentioned about 45 degrees, but you can do it in 30 degrees angle or 60 degrees angle based on how much of anteriorization you really want. That's based on the uh, petla cartilage uh, defect, which is there. When you want to medialize grossly, you it's better to, to choose a 30 degree angle where you will be able to uh, get more translation. Yes, sir. When you do not want to distalize, you can retain the distal hinge. Hinge, yeah. So when you want to distalize only, you actually need to cut it or proximalize. Yes, sir. And you had mentioned about the Tino disease. Uh, we that there was a recommendation to do Tino disease few years back. But when there is a raw bone there, uh, it usually uh, the tendon yes. heals onto the raw bone. Uh, unless you are um, proximalizing it, then the tension in the tendon might reduce. So unless it is for a petla baha, tino is for a petla alta is not uh, really done. Okay, sir. And, sir, uh, one, uh, and one, sorry. one doubt, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, regarding the figure on the left, uh, one thing I had a confusion with is the failure of the anterior tibial transfer procedure was because it created problems with kneeling. Now, fulcusins, if we do an angle more than 45 degrees, won't it create the same problem? Won't that bulge still be there, creating pressure on the skin, difficulty in kneeling and all? Yeah, good question. I think it's there in the next slide and I'll show. Okay, sir. So, uh, the other point, when you uh, put the screw, uh, you have to countersink these screws. Uh, they would have recommended 4.5 screws, but in our patients, 4 mm screws are good enough. Okay, sir. Long 4 mm screws. Counter sinking those screws are very, very important. Otherwise, there'll be a lot of irritation on the screw. Even after counter sinking, there'll be irritation. We have to remove those screws later on. So, yeah. in this picture, actually shows that well. Whatever spike is projecting out, can you see that uh, the right yes, side? Sir. Yes, sir. You need, do a, you need to osteotomize that spike and you okay. can place that same bone on the. Um, on the opposite side. Mm. Oh, the, the lateral. Yes, sir. Side. Understood. Yes. Lateral side. So that's what is recommended. It's actually described. You, but when you're retaining the distal hinge, uh, then uh, the, this spike is, will be only in the proximal side. Yes, sir. So, so when you, you when you proximalize, it should be the distal part must be should not be medialized. It should mm -hmm. be in the uh, center. Only the proximal part must be rotated out. Mm, yes, sir. Then that spike, you cut that spike which is projecting out and place that graft in the opposite side. Okay, sir. Understood. Yes, sir. That's what you do feel that spike quite prominent, which is, as you said. That's what we do to reduce that prominence. Yes, sir. Uh, that's the Tino disease. When you distalize, you need to do the Tino disease. That's actually not required. And regarding osteotomies, the petla, this is one of the cases where the petla instability was just because of this so much of valgus. So it's just not valgus. 
as when you go through the analysis, it's a rotational deformity also. So it had to be both the valgus as well as rotational deformity corrected. Ideally, it must have been done in two levels. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, what we did was uh, uh, did both rotational, I mean, valgus correction with this biplanar DFO, which is a ledge osteotomy, and did the rotational correction also with that same uh, uh, ledge osteotomy. There's one more wedge taken out from the ascend, I mean, ascending limb. So both yes. rotation and um, uh, valgus correction was done with the single level osteotomy. So those are extra points which I would like to add. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, any more points to add, sir? <laughs> Very good uh, contribution. Good moderation also. Thank you. So we shall move on to the plastic talk, please. Uh, Santos, uh, you're Rajan. Yeah. Uh, all these uh, values uh, which you are measuring is a static one. Uh, yeah. When uh, basically this petlar instability is more of like a dynamic event which uh, occurring when the patient is walking or patient is bending the knee, all those things. So how do you take those accounts when you're uh, operating these cases? When you're correcting, uh, soft tissue correction is mandatory. So MPFL reconstruction is a majority of time done along with these bony procedures, um, and uh, the VMO strengthening in the re in the rehab part. Uh, what uh, we've done, we last time we discussed was VMO strengthening. Quads must be strong, but the vastus medialis must be stronger than the lateralis. The common mistake is to keep on strengthening the lateralis. Lateralis should not be strengthened more than the medialis. So initial rehab, we do not concentrate on lateralis at all. It's just the quads and the VMO. So that helps to medialize the petla dynamically. So those are the things in the rehab part of it, which we try to address dynamically. And for the bony corrections, we are trying to increase the uh, limit from I mean, whatever TTTG. The indications, we are trying to lessen our indications just because of the dynamic factors. Just with addressing VMO and uh, conservative management should be able to address this. So only if it crosses the gross limit of uh, those uh, limitations which I mentioned, then only we try to address them. Otherwise, only MPFL and rehab is the mainstay. Rehab is for the dynamic aspects. Okay. Sir, so is my screen visible? Shall I start? Yeah, Arjun, please. So, well, I welcome everyone to today's Plasti, Plasti talk. In today's session, I'll be discussing about the intraoperative complication in total knee arthroplasty. Intraoperative complications are the surgeon's worst nightmares. The reported intraoperative complication literature includes vascular injuries, extensor mechanics injuries, MCL injury, intraoperative fractures, and bone cement implantation syndrome. This is a meta-analysis which was published in JPJs in 2020. Uh, which discuss the vascular injuries in total knee arthroplasty. The incidence in this meta-analysis, the incidence of vascular injuries in this meta-analysis was 54 per 100,000 TK. And among the reported cases, 21% of the patient required amputation. The most common injured vessels were popliteal artery followed by superficial femoral artery and anterior tibial artery. And geniculate artery complications were seen in 38% cases. So femoral artery occlusion is associated Associated with tunica utilization was rare, but when it is present, it mostly resulted in amputation. The popliteal artery transection is the second most likely injury resulting in amputation. While popliteal artery pseudoaneurysm and anterior tibial artery pseudoaneurysm rarely resulted in amputation. So let's discuss about the preoperative risk factors for arterial injuries. The preoperative risk factors for arterial injuries are vascular insufficiency, history of a vascular surgery done, popliteal aneurysm, absence of pedal pulses, and radiographic evidence of arterial calcification. So what can be done in drop to prevent a vascular injury? All of us know that popliteal artery is a lateral structure as it crosses the knee. In extension, the popliteal artery is one centimeter away from the tibial plateau, while in flexion, the distance is more. It is more than two centimeter. So flexing the knee clearly protects the artery. And at the same time, both hyperflexion and hyperextension led to severe tenting of the vessel. So single posterior retractor placed in position lateral to the PCL or a single retractor placed more than one centimeter into the soft tissue place the artery at risk. So a retractor placed on middle tibial condyle or a double prong retractor placed over the PCL is a safer alternative. 
this is a, just a demonstration of how the correct placement of the home and retractors has to be uh, how the home and retractors has to be placed you can see the this is a central point and you can see the uh, posterior home and it's in the medial tibial contact it's directed towards the medial tibial contact So the genicular artery injury, it accounts for 38% with higher predominance of the lateral inferior than the middle genicular artery. This is the lateral inferior. Uh, I'm showing my pointer to the lateral inferior genicular artery. Anatomically, the lateral inferior genicular artery uh, causes all the top of lateral meniscus. So when we do a meniscectomy, it is, there is a chance for us to cut, cut the vessel longitudinally along the course and the vessel might be uh, lacerated in multiple locations or we can even cut it lengthwise. So this is a recent publication in American Journal of Orthopedics which came out in 2018 where they emphasize the imp uh, importance of surgeon to specifically identify these structures intraoperatively and adequately cauterize these vessels. And as long as these arteries are cauterized, addition blood loss and potential vascular pseudoaneurysms are prevented. So the take-home message from this is that the posterior part of lateral meniscus, when the meniscus is excised, it should uh, be excised with the cautery in cautery mode instead of a cut mode. So now let's discuss about the extensive mechanism injury. The extensive mechanism injury, the incidence in available literature is between 1 and 12 percentage. The treatment of extensive mechanism is quite difficult and the results are not satisfactory. So such things has to be prevented from happening. The usual site for rupture is a tibial tuberosity and the less frequent sites are intratendinous and infrapatellar tendon rupture. The risk of injury increases when the patellar tendon mobility decreases like in patella baja or when uh, or in a setting of previous surgery or when there is a severe limitation of range of movement in the knee. So what can be done to prevent the intraoperative extensive mechanism injury in total knee arthroplasty? When doing the uh, medial parapetalar arthrotomy, it is recommended that we do it as close to the vastus medialis muscle with less than one centimeter of tendon left attached to the muscle. And it is recommended not to proceed straight into the superior pole and make a sharp angle medially. Instead, the superior middle pole should be used as a land landmark and we should, gentle, we should make a gentle curved incision between the superior pole and the via mobility. So this is how it, it has to be done. You can see there, it's a general curve. This is a superior part of the patella. And uh, so we have to make a general curve there. And when we do that, uh, Ransel Manau, the insertion site should be consistently visualized to ensure that the tissue is not separating from the tibial tube. If the knee is stiff, and if we cannot bend to 90 degrees, simply forcing the knee past 90 degree places the tendon at risk. So once the arthrotomy is done, the patella has to be retracted and the lateral patella femoral ligaments has to be released. And if still the patella is, inert, is inverted, you have to check the proximal extent of the exposure. So because increasing the split in the cordyceps tendon will make the patella more mobile. Also, patella, removing the patella osteophytes or the femoral osteophyte can improve in uh, patella mobility and help in exposure. So patella has, the aversion of patella is has to be avoided because it's reported that it can cause bone necrosis and avulsion of patellar tendon. And it's good if some patellar fat pad can be uh, preserved because it helps in protection of the blood supply to the patella and it and it, say, and it is said to be play and it say it plays an important role in preventing necrosis and later fragmentation of the patella. So we have to do a make a plane between the patellar tendon and fat pad, and the fat pad has to be excised parallel to the tendon. And if you are doing the patella resurfacing, the patella has to be protected with a trial cap. If, that is, if it is cut early in the procedure. And appropriate patella tracking and uh, avoid uh, patella over section has to be avoided. So this is a demonstration of how the plane has to be made between the infrapatellar fat pad and the patella tendon. You can make out the artery here. So treatment, primary repair can be done whenever possible. Reconstruction techniques are used in patients with so poor soft tissue quality. 
for reconstruction, biological graft has to be used like hamstring tendon autograft, at least, or peroneal tendon autograft are other options. Now let's discuss about the MCL injuries. The incidence between 2.2 to 2.7 percentage. Unrecognized MCL injuries can cause early instability, which can cause early implant wear, and it, it can lead to early revision. So an MCL injury can be missed intraoperatively, and often these are hidden injury. The sometimes unexpected, uh, sudden unexpected medial laxity might be the only only finding in draw or a sudden ex excessive exposure or unstable forward movement of the tibia. Or it, we be able to recognize it during when we do the valgus and varus stress to assess the ligament balance with trial components or with fi final components in place. And occasionally a popping sound can be heard, but it might not be seen in, might, might not be there in all cases. So the treatment option, the technique varies according to the level of injury. This is how an intrasubstance there has to be a repair. It's a cadaveric demonstration. The sutures uh, can be placed in the cement before cementing, while the final tension and nodes will be made after component cementing and final polyethylene insert in place. There is no clear consensus regarding the technique of repair. It varies among surgeons. So regarding constraint and non-constrained implant, again, this is controversial. There's no gold standard treatment for intraoperative MCL injuries during PK. Constraint processes, it appears to be the safer option, but it carries certain disadvantages like because, because we are, because since we are adding more constraint, we are adding more stress on the cement bone implant interface. We are sacrificing more bones, so revision uh, can become complicated. And again, it's more expensive and is more technically demanding. So use of constraint implant is in general is discouraged when less constraint options are available. Repairs seems to give adequate results, but it is more reliable when it is associated with uh, operation. So tips to prevent iatrogenic MCL injury. When we do when we do, do the antromedial release, the medial osteophytes has to be excised early to relieve the tension on the MCL. And when we are doing the femur cuts, with the jig, especially the post, posterior middle cut, using a thin saw can be helpful, especially in small knees in female patient. And uh, when you're doing the femur cut, the middle, the retractor should be placed between the medial femoral condyle and MCL origin to protect against the saw blade oscillation excursion. Now this is actually this is a picture is showing how the medial release should not be done. Actually, when we are removing it, removing, uh, when we are doing the medial release with the osteotom, the foot has to be in external rotation and it has to be released from anterior to posterior direction in the mid coronal plane at the level of joint line instead of proximal to distal direction. So, this is a, a cadaveric demonstration of the technique of tibial avulsion repair. The tibial avulsion anchor can be placed if there is a uh, tear, tibial avulsion anchors can be placed. Anchors has to be placed six centimeter distal to the jawline. Two anchors are needed, one anterior and one posterior. And this is a demonstration of how femoral avulsion of the MCL can be repaired with a screw and spiked washer. This is a a uh, publication which came out from Kenga Hospital recently where they studied the intraoperative MCL bony avulsion. So as per this publication, it can be managed successfully with screw and washer construct without the need for increased prosthetic constraint in primary TK. So the presence of severe varus deformity, knee subluxation, and cup and sosa morphology or what is known as the pagoda sign tend to have an increased chance of MCL avulsion injury. So this is an uh, meta-analysis and systemic review, which was published in 2021. Um, in this publication, they are saying that TK with intraoperative MCL injury, where it can increase risk of complications and remission. Aversion injuries accounted for 59%. mid substance disruptions accounted for 41%. MCL injuries were most common in middle, most common seen when the medial soft tissue release is done or 
hyperflexion of the knee is done during subluxation of the tibia or when trial components were placed in a tight flexion gap. Now let's discuss about the intraoperative fractures. The incidence of intraoperative fractures, it, uh, it is from 0.2 to 4.4 percentage. There is factors are osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis, advanced age, female gender, chronic steroid use, posterior stabilized knee arthroplasty, metabolic bone, dis metabolic bone disorders, complex primary knee TKA associated with severe pre and bone defects. All of us know that uh, femoral fractures are more common when, when we use PS knees because the intercondylar notch acts as a stress tracer. So if the implant, it's very essential that if uh, that the implant or trial uh, has to be when it is in, inserted or extracted, there should not be any varus or valgus antiation as this can give stresses to either condyles. Also, there's a variability in box cut between the different implants. This was a publication, a comparative study comparing the different implant. They found that the Simmer persona jig had significantly smaller tridimensional box area compared to the Biomet, Vanguard, and Sigma PS. The difference between these jig were more statistically significant in small and medium sized implant. Hence, surgeons should exercise caution while using the PS knee design, especially in female patient when it is when there is associated osteopor osteoporosis or rheumatoid arthritis patients who require smaller implants so about notching it's very important that this is a publication which came, it's a systematic review and meta-analysis which was published in 2021 the the most important finding of this is the, this study was that patient exposed to anterior femoral notching more than three mm were higher risk for supracondylar periprosthetic fracture. So what are the recommendations for prevention of intraoperative fracture? Identify the patient with risk factors. Appropriate pharmacological treatment to improve bone mineral density can be done. Stemmed components, documents, plates, and screws should be available as backup. In short stage, female patient, a CR design or ultracongruent polyethylene insert should be considered. And avoid notching by proper sizing of the femur. And in PS knee design, the box cut should be made wide enough to be or, or slightly larger than the dimension of the final implant box. And whenever uh, the implant has to be always lateralized on the femur to decrease the distance between the medial femoral cortex, to increase the distance between the medial femoral cortex and the bottom of the box cut. The fractures of femoral condyle during exposure of the proximal tibia can be prevented by that is when you're doing the ransom maneuver, force should not be applied. And we have to disengage the tibia by removing the posterior osteophytes before hyperplexing the knee. Any virus or valgus malalignment during insertion and extrusion of trial and final femoral component should be avoided. Also, overstuffing of the tibia with cement, on cementation, overstuffing of the tibia with cement or oversealous hammering during final seating of the tibial component has to be avoided to prevent fractures. So, uh, about bone cement implantation, impl implantation syndrome, it is a very rare cat catastrophe. Um, it is it presents as hypoxia, hypotension, or both, or unexpected loss of consciousness occurring around the time of cementation or process insertion or reduction of the joint, or even during limb tunicate deflation, in patient undergoing cement and bone surgery. The etiology and pathophysiology of uh, this is poorly and understood and the incidence of rights way, uh, varies widely in the literature. And the embolization occurs as a result of high intramedullary pressures developing between the semen and processes insertion. So complications are always underreported in literature. The complications can occur in each step. There is no alternative to proper training because with proper training, we can prevent many complications like like this like the photos which is uh, shown here the more trained we are the we'll be better prepared to prevent or deal with such complications so take home message is my take home message is that the patients the the patient who these patients has to be identified preoperatively with the risk factors Exposure should be adequate to prevent patellar tendon rupture and the foot should be in external rotation when in flexion, especially when doing the ransom maneuver. The geniculate artery has to be cauterized. 
for ransom and our homeland should be on the middle table and we must be we must do proper sizing of the femur to avoid notching and always we have to see the interoperative complication interoperatively and treat it otherwise we will see it later in the post op period thank you uh and a very nice presentation arjun and this nice. is a very important yeah it's a very important topic uh, uh, for uh, uh, even for the experienced surgeon as well as a uh, young surgeon um uh one should uh, prevent this complication that is very important that is a take home message uh, all should uh, understand uh, well uh, uh, doing this trick here all these complications are preventable that is very important thing and um, so if you execute the surgery with proper pre op planning with uh, intraoperative um, uh, execution with proper uh, recheck of every step so you can avoid all these catastrophic complications so the number one is a preventable that's a very important message you should understand from this presentation number one number two starting uh, with the vascular injury the 50% of the litigation is because of this vascular injury but it's very rare complication number one so if you understand the anatomy uh, especially while placing the homen uh, that is very important which you have clearly mentioned in your presentation the how the popliteal vessel which travels in the posterior aspect and so while placing the homen number one uh, you should avoid using the any sharp homens that is very important you should you should not use the sharp homen it should be a blunt curve either a double prong or it's a blunt homen you should use and especially when you are placing the homen always you should place medial to the pcl that is very very important and uh, number 2 the complete subluxation of the tibia by using the ransol maneuver by pushing the posterior homen uh, it will displace the popliteal vessel from approximately 1.52 cm will fall posteriorly so that is very important step number 2 and number 3 the preventable step is uh, while taking the tibial osteotomy cut so whenever you are uh, you must have noticed whenever we are uh, uh, pausing the saw blade and whenever we reach the posterior aspect always you should try to stop when you are getting the feel of give away that's very important you should not try to complete the cut so when uh, tibial lift off when it happens when the tibial cut there you should stop the further proceeding of the saw blade that is very very important because if you try to complete the cut with saw blade invariably you have to reach the posterior aspect unless otherwise if you're not doing the proper ransol maneuver it will tend to attach the vessel and come back because it's very close in that position and most commonly reported is that even the intimal damage not even a transaction any stretching or intimal damage can uh, go for a thrombus and uh, uh, i had a one uh, issue when uh, when you are operating in 2019 that patient had a valgus with flexion deformity with a very severe stiff knee female patient that was a post traumatic knee patient was a hpc ag positive that female patient had a uh, immediate post op when we uh, came for the rounds in the evening and uh, that patient was complaining of excruciating pain it was not settled with any medications and that was a one alarming sign in the immediate post op and you should be very cautious and you never hesitate to call for a uh, expert opinion especially vascular surgeon opinion even the late evening or middle of the night uh, and in the in the patient uh, we did a immediate doppler we could identify there was a evolving thrombus in the popliteal artery so immediately we shifted to psg and uh, we did a thrombolysis for the patient and that patient recovered very well but even we didn't go for uh, any uh, intervention even that time uh, uh, the vascular surgeon and psg he advised for a we'll observe for 24 hours i think it should recanalize and probably this patient had a very stiff or calcified vessel and then we are correcting with the valgus with a very uh, stiff knee you should be very cautious already the vessels uh, this elasticity is usually lost in those situation and when you are identifying the calcification in the x-ray always uh, explain to your uh, anesthetist also you will be applying the tunica only during the cementation so that is very important and reduce your tunicate time and uh, another important aspect uh, to all of my fellows i used to tell never leave your theater without checking the distal pulse after removing the tunicate that is very very important and we are still following that 
and we have to follow and we have to document that the pulse distal pulse is palpable while uh, leaving the theater these are the very important steps when you're understanding the vascular injury and uh, uh, you ex um, exactly you mentioned how you have to prevent the uh, bleeding especially with the lateral inferior genicular artery you know, i always follow the uh, cautery coagulation mode while cutting the lateral meniscus and you have to coagulate and that is one of the preventable cause when the post-op sudden increase in hematoma or aneurysm that the cases has been reported so these things you should take care when you're dealing with a vascular injury number one so number two is a uh, you are when you are dealing with the uh, extensor mechanism injury and uh, what you are exactly mentioning this is also a preventable one and you should avoid creating any uh, problem in patella tendon avulsion by doing the proper maneuver you should take care if you are operating especially in virus with severe deformity patients with stiff knee and patients with a rheumatoid knees all these knees are high risk for going for a, any extensor mechanism injury rupture and you have to tackle accordingly depends on the uh, level of uh, injury especially whether it's an avulsion or mid substance or uh, tibial tubercle avulsion that's very important and it, this is also a preventable one number two number three coming to the mcl injury and it carries a very uh, unsatisfactory outcome when you are uh, dealing with the mcl injury unless otherwise it's, it's arising from the bony avulsion rather than a uh, uh, midsection midsection carries a uh, poor outcome in compared to the bony avulsion so the common is a femoral side tibial avulsion and it can be managed with the screws or washers or additional anchors it can be managed and if required you can add a level of constraint and coming to the midsection stair you have to augment with uh, additional graft that is very important just by a midsection repair it won't uh, uh, give a satisfactory outcome or you have to when you're augmenting always add a constraint level that is very important in those situation and always you should avoid uh, doing the midsection stair what exactly you mentioned is that when you're taking the posterior femoral condyle cut especially in the small females always we used to and so that's what i always tell my the person who is standing in the medial side they are doing a very important jump job than a surgeon because they are protecting the most important structure is the mcl they never try to do any assisted work like and suddenly they will turn to assist from the table by lifting the cautery or they want to take a nebular and, and suddenly they will turn to strip or pull the mcl they should not do always the person who is standing in the middle side is very very important and you should educate them when they are coming for a assisting your surgery how important it is when you are protecting the mcl that is very important and when you sudden give away in a flexion so always you should be very cautious you are damage the mcl and identify and try to rectify on table itself that is very important always uh, if you have the luxury of like uh, we have a arthroscopic surgeon with us if you want to do any augmentation procedure always take a help from um, our arthroscopic colleagues so that they can do a better augmentation procedure with the grafts that's very important and distally you can do a anchor anchors with uh, augmentation with the sutures that's very important and uh, the bone cement implantation syndrome is a rare but still you can avoid that the technique uh, what you can do is a venting of the medullary canal the venting is when you are uh, cementing the uh, femur and tibia just make a drills in the proximal tibia two or three holes through that while pressurizing the cement now you should see there is a small cement seepage from that so that will avoid the intramedullary pressure these are the few tips i like to share with you thank you thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank you dr viraj for the discussion and yeah thank you sir uh, you have case already yeah i am leaving now thank you thank you sir thank you Yeah, no, good, good conclusion. Uh, you right. Good. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Most important uh, part of uh, learning surgery. Thank yes. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, from me also, you are very nice. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Good night, Gopal. Good night. We shall end the meeting, sir. Good night, sir. Yeah. yeah. Santosh, I sent you something in the mail. Please look at it. Sure, sir. Sure, and thanks, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night.